And we're live. All right. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm just going to move this up slightly. There we go. Excellent. So, um, thanks, everybody. I'm really looking forward to the game. I actually haven't had a game for about three weeks, so um, this is this is good for me as well. <laughs> awesome. Hey, I'm, uh, my family is going to be coming back probably in an hour, I'd imagine. Great. Um, and they'll just move through really quick, so it'll be a five-minute delay or something like that. I'll terrify them on the way through. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Well, appreciate it. Now, um, I'll just quickly go around. Um, I'm Joe. Um, I'm the author of Rapture um, and the founder of Story Weaver. Uh, if you've played Rapture before, and what what other sort of games you've played before? Your left. Sorry, with me. Your, your left or that left? That left. <laughs> yeah, that's confusing. That left. <laughs> that's <weird. laughs> hey, uh, Daniel Williams. I uh, have not played Rapture. I'm extremely excited. I'm very glad to meet you. Um, uh, games I, I typically play uh, Civ Five, mm -hmm. Sins of a Solar Empire. Right. So you're a uh, video gamer. Yes, sir. Excellent. Oh, but as far as as far as tabletop uh, uh, games like uh, Resistance mm -hmm. and uh, Betrayal, House on Hill. Betrayal, House on Haunted Hill. Oh, right. Okay. You had a little right little RPG experience with Call yeah. of Duty, right? Oh, yeah. That's oh, easy. good. Oh, well, you like this then. <laughs> he, loved, he loved Call of Duty. Okay, and thanks, Daniel. That's good. And uh, next up? I'm Zach. Zach? Uh, he got me into role-playing. Zach. Zach. Yep. Uh, probably seventh grade or something like that, so he introduced me to DD, second edition, and been role-playing ever since. Ah, oh, dear. So, Bad influence. We were <laughs> long time, yeah, long time pals. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, Rick, I know you, but please introduce yourself all the same. Yeah, my name is uh, Rick Perez, and I play everything. Uh, I also operate a gaming blog called Let's Level Up .net. Great. It's a good one. I like that blog. <laughs> and finally, uh, over here on the, uh, on, on, which is my, uh, my left, I think that's your right, not sure. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, all right. Uh, my name is Matt Aguirre. Uh I also play pretty much... Anything and everything. Uh, I will say, particularly, what really interests me about Rapture is I'm a big space fan, especially Space 4. I've played a lot of the Dead Space games and stuff like that, and I loved that set, you know, that kind of... I even enjoy a lot of the kind of the Star Wars horror novels, too, that'll kind of get into the Space <laughs> horror setting. So I can't see the dog, so it doesn't know... <laughs> you know what? We're gonna, we're, we're gonna bring him into the, we're gonna bring him into the campaign. Um, he, he's he's now gonna be one of your uh, characters on the ship. So that is <laughs> let's that's get Bruce Willis's dog. That's Bruce Willis's dog. Let's get straight to it. Um, you guys got a bunch of ten sided dice. You. I can see them on the table. Excellent. Okay. Um, so let me very quickly go through Rapture as a as a gaming concept. Um. Rapture blends hard science fiction, so this is not Star Wars type science fiction, it is, uh, it's even more hard than something like um, Battlestar Galactica, it's, it's Greg Egan, it's, uh, you know, uh, Simon Bear, it's that, that level. So when we wrote this world setting, we really wanted to make sure that um, the science was very consistent, very based, and there is no magic per se, there's no psionics, there's none of that sort of stuff going on. Uh, but that's not to say there's not supernatural themes here. There, there are plenty of those. Um, so uh, some of the core technologies that you'll probably want to get familiar with before we start the game. One of them is that it is possible to travel faster than light. And uh, that's done through what they call gravity drives. It was borrowed from the concept of spin dizzy ships uh, from an author whose name I cannot remember from a million years ago. But basically the concept is that um, uh, about 300 years prior to the events that take place here, um, it was discovered how to ma manipulate gravity, uh, the actual fundamentals of gravity. And so the ships, what they do is they, they get as far away from gravity fields as they can possibly get, and then they turn on a particular gravity field around the ship, and it, it fires the ship like a rail gun, if you will, uh, at superluminal speeds, because it literally drops out of, out of um, uh, being bound by relativity. Uh, that's really good. I mean, that gets you gets you places fast. Unfortunately, it takes you about a year or so to get out a, as far away from the sun in order to turn on those drives. So space travel is very slow, very arduous. Then you 
you get far enough away from a gravity well that you turn it on and months later you will arrive where you want to be. The faster you travel, the more chances of you being off by a slight degree. And of course, if you're off by a slight degree and you're traveling multiple times the speed of light, you don't know where you're going to end up. So it's important to have those calculations done, done at a very fine-grained level. Um, the next piece of technology which is incredibly important for this world setting, uh, although it'll be in the background a lot, is called the Photonic Teleportation Array. Now that's not teleportation as in, uh, as in Star Trek, that's communications. This is work which is already underway. We actually know that this, this has the potential to work, although we're not too sure how to make it work for communications. And basically it means that you, you have a device which is manufactured in one spot, and through quantum entanglement you can take one end of that device and one end you know, from one location, another end to any location, anywhere. And they will be intimately bound. So you can then in theory photonically uh, 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 teleport photons between them, which gives you the possibility of having communications instantly. So breaking the impact, it, it, it actually happens backwards in time, but that's another interesting side trait of this. But it, it happens instantly <coughs> between two points. Now that means that you can have um, the Earth communicating with solar colonies in real time. Um, hugely important if you're trying to build a, a civilization. Um, some of the other technologies which are really, really important are AIs. And AIs in this world are, um, you, you'd consider them idiot savants in that they are purpose-built machines and trained to do something extremely well. Uh, just cancel that. Um, but they're not and, and they, they have a personality, they, they have all of the things that we would consider consciousness, but they're not generalists, they're specialists. Um, pretty much all ships have an AI, because ships by their nature are very expensive to run, uh, it's much better to hand that over to the computer. Uh, the AIs are relatively large devices, uh, they work on a combination of quantum computing, um, which again is a, is a real field, but they're primarily a software neural net. Uh, your ship, yes, it will have an AI. Yay. Um, what else is important? Ah, banned technologies. There are a whole bunch of technologies that through the, through the history leading up to this point were discovered not to be the best idea. The first of those is what you'd consider wetware, you know, cybernetics, that sort of stuff. It's not that it's banned, it's just that nobody wants it really, because nobody likes to stick machines into their body. That's what's been discovered. Yeah, some people do, but even super soldiers you know, they just don't want to go there. Uh, retroviral engineering of humans is banned by many of the colonial powers, by many of the powers, but it's not altogether unheard of. So, uh, cloning, Joe? Yeah, that's well, also too. Cl cloning is a little bit different. Ret retroviral is basically where you would take, um, think space marines from Warhammer. That's a classic example of retroviral. So, you inject into somebody's DNA, uh, or you inject, uh, you inject a virus into somebody that will then change the structure of their DNA over time. A good example of when that goes horribly, horribly wrong is the second, uh, the remake of the movie The Fly with Jeff Goldblum. You guys seen that? Yeah, right. Yeah. That could be done with retroviral. Yeah, it's not a good look. <laughs> um, nanotechnology is very, <laughs> is very real. Um, it's basically um, banned even for non-military non uses uh, because there was a number of accidents that happened uh, on Earth previously that wiped out massive amounts of crops. Um, so the idea, you know, tech, nanotech does exist. It's not People know how to do it, they just don't use it a lot. So those are some of the, the Frankenstein-type technologies which may or may not exist in this game. Just giving you a backgrounder. Uh, the politics of the world. Have you guys read very quickly some of the, 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 the background setting of this world? Um, I, these guys have kind of gotten yeah, a little bit. Okay. In, a nutshell, in a nutshell. In a nutshell. Uh, this is set about 600 years uh, in our future. Um, in the next century, Earth falls into a massive series of resource wars. Um, and that basically obliterates, um, not militaristically, but certainly politically, most of what we conceive as modern day civilizations. Um, out of those resource wars, which were uh, in some cases pretty brutal, um, the different power blocks that arose were, uh, um, it, it, there was two things which happened. First of all, the, the end of the resource wars 
aligns roughly to the realization that the resources have run out, so you've got to have a different way of pro predominantly producing energy. So renewable energies was a big one. China came out of those resource war period really, really well, simply because it's investing huge amounts of its GDP into renewable energy, and it went into Africa. Economically, it went into Africa very heavily to gain their mineral resources uh, and some of their agricultural base. So it more or less terraformed parts of Africa. And the result of that was a block called the Sino-Africana block, which predominantly speaks Mandarin. Basically, China is the dominant superpower in that sense. Uh, another large conglomerate superpower is the Southern Union, which consists of Australia. Yay, they're a bunch of bastards. Um, and <laughs> most of the ASEAN states. And um, Australia basically came out of the resource wars relatively well because they stuck up some space platforms and actually nuked a few people. Uh, and they said, anybody, anybody messes with any of our territories and the people in our, that we consider our protectorate, despite this being illegal against the UN Charter of the time, they just did it anyway. Um, so there's a little bit of a joke in, in Australian politics in that one. So that consists of Malaysia, Indonesia, and so forth. Um, they tend to be, uh, the Southern Union is not particularly strong in the outer colonies, but they, they do, they tend to have a fairly strong s military stance. Then you've got the Democratic Russian Union. Now, if you think Dune and the houses of Harkon, that's it. They, they became ultra-capitalistic after the, the refall of um, the, the communist bloc. They, they, they had the crap beaten out of them during the resource wars. And they broke up into seven major houses. Uh, they're one of the few political powers that is deeply religious in that they, they have a, uh, a very orthodox uh, view. But of course, the church is basically the information collection agency for the seven houses. Uh, so when you go to confession, you're basically being <laughs> recorded. Um, so it's a, pretty, it's a pretty rough regime. And guess what sort of ship you're on? Yes, you're on a DRU ship. Um, so it's, it's very feudal. They're a very feudal enterprise. Um, Another group was the North American Alliance, and that basically is uh, Canada, America, um, uh, some other parts of, of lower South America. Uh, again, the Americans were in a very, very bad position during the resource wars because they hadn't invested in renewables. They didn't really have much of an energy base of their own by the end of it. Um, they had massive problems. There was just a whole range of issues they couldn't deal with politically, and they completely broke down. They had a couple of attempts at um, socialism, a couple of attempts at outright communism, um, backwards and forwards through a couple of effectively civil wars, and ended up being the NAA, which is as close to modern era KGB as you can imagine. So it is a, it is a police state. Um, that said, they're very effective, and they're not a particularly nasty police state, but effectively it's, it's a... And in fact, when you look at the things from... NSA at the moment, you say, maybe not much has changed. I don't know. <laughs> um, so the NEIA is, is, is quite prevalent uh, in, in space. Um, I'm forget oh, yes, then you've got the Indo-American Collective. That is India with much of the South American continent, and they invested heavily uh, in biofuels during the, during the wars, but also food production, which stood them in very good trade stead with the Sino bloc. And as a result, they came out relatively unscathed, but they are masters of genetic engineering, which is not illegal. It's, and in fact, it's, it's, it's a very active um, area. But they do a lot of terraforming and so forth, and um, they're very prevalent in space because they just hitch a ride on anybody else who's going out there because everybody wants their skills in changing the ecology of the planets. Um, so uh, those are the main political powers. Oh, the Freepers. The Freepers are um, basically high-tech anarchists. <laughs> and they uh, they have their own private states, and they just carve out their own little... They're, they're basically egalitarian um, meritocracy. Um, then you've got the political... Sorry, then you've got the corporate powers, crystal skies. You know, your typical big corporations, um, some of which are evil, some of which aren't, some of which look evil and aren't, and some of which look really, really nice but are hideously evil. So, you know, you can take your choice on that, play it as you wish. They're big corporate powers. Um, when Earth... When Confucius was first settled, that's the first um, colonial uh, planet that was settled by the Chinese, um, what happened is there was a bit of a gold rush. So suddenly people realised that they could get to other worlds. These were fresh virgin worlds. 
And so pretty much all of the political powers, except for the Nippon Empire, which will not, it's not actually in the rulebook, but it is in the world setting, but that's the next rulebook. <laughs> um, they all rushed out into space, and so there's about 50-odd, uh, sorry, 35-odd colonial settlements now, but there's a lot more than that in space stations and orbitals and other things. So mankind, it, it's been the boom years for mankind. We've got out the skies, we... We've um, settled planets, we're farming them, we're, in the case of Confucius, we're being very nice to the planet, and we're actually doing most of our mining out in the asteroid belts and slinging rock back in. Uh, that's where you guys will come in with this adventure. Um, so that's the world setting. Any questions? That was a real quick 10-minute recap of the world. Yep, not nice. Okay. So basically, everybody's, everybody's having a great time. Things look good in the universe. Um... There's no real heavy squabbling between the political powers because energy has been taken care of, resources are more or less taken care of, and now you've got infinite space. There's a lot more habitable planets than originally thought. And in fact, since I wrote this game, it's now looking like you know, the theories which I had on that are coming true. So, you know, times are good. <laughs> anyway, um, the background of this game is horror. So in the midst of all of this wonderful technology and a new age of prosperity for humankind, um, even though that there are you know different political stances, people are getting a, just getting on with things, doing a good job. Um, then all of a sudden the rapture happens on Earth. Now in this game, I try to be in this world setting. I'm being very true to the Bible in that demons aren't necessarily huge things with horns on their head that run around with swords. They're much more nuanced than that. A demon is is actually uh, an Ephilim potentially, uh, depending on how you read it. Um, but most of the evil that remains out in space, because unfortunately the gates of hell only opened on Earth and the rapture only happened on Earth, because that's the way it's written in the Bible. Um, as a result of that, what's out here is much more likely to be everybody's got a temptation spirit that rides on them. Everybody's got, you know, if you've got a disease, it's actually an unclean spirit. All of these negative things that happen in our world are spirits from hell. And that's a very old, very, very Old Testament uh, view of, of the universe. It's almost a, um, almost a Shintoist sort of view in one sense, but we won't go into that debate. So it's much more likely that anything bad that happens to you guys is because of you guys. <laughs> um, now, the other part of that is you must play your characters as if they are in a horror movie. They are disposable. Ride them, to, to quote uh, Apocalypse World, ride your characters like they're stolen cars. Okay? You want them to die in horrible ways. You want to crash them. You want to, play, you, you want to be doing need for speed with your characters. And that's a good thing because that's how we're going to get the body count up. Okay, so um, the, the, the rapture has happened, but the reality is that the majority of people, certainly you, you lot, will not believe that that's what, what it is. I mean, that's just stupid. Some of you don't even, won't even be very familiar with the Bible. Uh, and those of you that are probably have more a liberalistic view. And that's what we call our, our faction. It's our philosophy. It's our way of looking at what's happened. So with that, let's create some characters. Now, I sent through a list of characters. Now, let me just go and pull it up on the other screen here. Um, here's, a, oops, here's a bunch of the characters on... Well, first of all, I better tell you where you're at. You're a bunch of space miners. You are in the Confucius system. You are in the hide-in rings um, just outside the Great World Asteroid Belt. You're sitting over asteroid, local asteroid uh, 3LV6-51134. You've got a claim pending on that. Uh, as the game opens, you will be striking a mother load, so all's good. Uh, then things will turn to shit. Um, you are... <laughs> 